Geronim Capaldo. The stage is yours. Good night, everyone. Um, it's great to be here, and I apologize for um, speaking in English. Unfortunately, I don't speak Dutch. And um, it's, uh, I'm particularly happy to uh, be talking to everyone and see so much engagement. It's great to see uh, Kuhn again, with whom I really love to disagree, and I keep doing it. <laughs> um, so um, let me uh, first um, uh, say something very clearly. Uh, some of you know that I work at the International Labour Organization, and I do as an economist. However, what I'm going to talk about tonight does not reflect the position of the ILO because it's based on work I did as a, a researcher at Tufts University uh, in Massachusetts. And it's, um, I'm here on my personal time, and um, uh, therefore I speak uh, for myself based on my research. So. Um, as a European citizen, uh, about a year ago, I started uh, looking into uh, this uh, issue of the TTIP, reading the various studies that have been produced and that um, uh, somehow maintain that, that there would be good impacts coming from TTIP on the Europeans' uh, incomes and economic lives. And uh, these studies go into an enormous amount of details, as you've seen, and uh, I, I haven't uh, done that, but I was uh, struck by uh, some similarities that there are between those studies when it comes to the economic effects, just the economic effects. So I, 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 I haven't um, uh, really um, looked as deeply into issues such as uh, regulatory cooperation or, or um, matters like that, but I've looked into the macroeconomic effects. So broadly, I've looked into what these studies say about the impact of TTIP on our incomes, on our employment, and on our trade, and other variables of the so-called macroeconomy. And um, as I mentioned a moment ago, I was struck by the fact that uh, somehow the main studies that uh, have been produced, and, and some of them have been endorsed by the European Commission, um, they all make basically the same points. So initially I thought that's great, they're confirming each, each other's results so that there must be some, uh, some truth in it. Uh, but the issue then that I grew increasingly uncomfortable about is that uh, somehow I realized that these studies are based on the same economic model. And being uh, a researcher that works a little bit on modeling, uh, I'm, I'm very well aware of the fact that when you use an economic model, there, uh, you cannot necessarily expect all answers from the same model because models are very much conditioned by their own assumptions because they simplify reality, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in, in a way that is not justifiable. Now, uh, just uh, let's take a, a very quick look at this um, results of the main studies that, that I talked about. Uh, the result, uh, the, the study that is mostly um, uh, mentioned by the European Commission is the CEPR study, but also the, C, uh, the um, C, uh, CP studies and the ECORIS studies. And um, these studies all uh, look, all, all project a large increases in bilateral exports, and we've heard how that is important, and it's true, because trade is very much um, uh, summarized by these bilateral exports. But the way bilateral exports really impact our economy is by their net result. So what matters isn't so much how much exports increase, but also how much imports increase, because whenever we have an increase in trade, both uh, things happen. And so in in all cases, we see that there is a, a very large difference between this large increases in bilateral exports and these comparatively small increases in net exports, which are the ones that contribute to our income. Um, and um, the reason why this happens is because, according to all these studies, it, um, transatlantic trade would increase as a consequence of the uh, enter into force of TTIP, but it would increase largely at the expense of intra-European trade. In other words, we're going to trade in Europe much more with the United States, but we're going to trade, according to these studies, much less with each other. And this is in a way, you know, I, I really like to point out that this is a little bit of a paradoxical effect uh, when seen in the context of the European Union, who we are told, uh, that which we're told is, is mainly aiming at increasing integration among countries. So I like to call this a disintegration effect. It goes quite the other way, um, the opposite way than, uh, to the one that we expect. And um, consequently, because of these small increases in net exports, these studies point out that there are very small increases in 
GDP, that is a, a measure of aggregate income. Now, how do we interpret these numbers? 0.5%, it's very important. This is not 0.5% per year. This is 0.5% or less after 15 years or something like that, and, and that's it. So we are talking about uh, very uh, small increases, uh, one-off. Um, now, as I said, uh, I was struck by the fact that these studies tend to use the same model, and, uh, and you know, this is a very standard model. It's a model that's commonly used for these types of calculations. However, it's, a, it's also an economic model that's shown its limits already uh, has been showing its limits already for several decades and, and the problems have been pointed out at the technical level by academics but also in the policy debate and in, in many practical experiences of liberalizations. This model is called CGE, it stands for Computable General Equilibrium Model. And um, I, I find that in this case, uh, this model is particularly inappropriate because of several assumptions that it relies on which I find not necessarily um, absurd, not necessarily a reasonable in an absolute sense, but I find them unreasonable in the European context, especially. Um, so the first assumption is the assumption of flexible prices. Uh, my colleague earlier pointed out that I, I go with the assumption of fixed prices. Well, the, the issue here, I think, is why we choose the assumption of uh, fixed versus flexible prices. Uh, the question uh, here, the, the main issue that I'm uncomfortable with here is that uh, according to this standard model, the economy adjusts very, very quickly thanks to an extreme flexibility of prices. It means that whatever happens, whenever there is a little bit of disequilibrium in the market, whenever there is a little bit of unemployment, for example, prices will change immediately to absorb this wasted resources. So let's say there is a little bit of unemployment. It means assuming that immediately salaries will drop so that workers will become more profitable to hire and firms will hire them immediately. Not only that. We also uh, assume in this model that uh, whenever there are, that there are no barriers of any kind between resources that are used in one sector and resources that are used in other sectors. Going with the unemployment example, say that some workers lose their jobs in, the, um, in some manufacturing industry and uh, not only prices will, um, wages will drop immediately so that they can become re-employable, but also those workers will be immediately rehirable in sectors that are expanding. In every moment, some sectors are contracting and some sectors are expanding. But we know it's very difficult for workers that have spent 20 years building their skills in manufacturing, for example, to be employable in, in the software industry or in the banking sector, which is, might be also expanding. So I think that these two assumptions, flexibility of prices and wages, and the absence of um, barriers between sectors are particularly not um, yeah, um, uh, realistic and, and certainly do not apply to the context of the European economy where we see unemployment lasting for longer periods of time now where many countries are battling high unemployment rates and prices aren't helping. Uh, flexibility of prices isn't coming to the rescue and, and, and in a way it's a good thing because otherwise we would see this plummeting of prices and we would uh, witness the continuous impoverishment of the labor force which, which is already taken place but you know we would see it even more. Another important um, feature that uh, I see in, in these models uh, is not an assumption, it's a result. It's the um, loss of uh, public revenue in the medium term. So according to all these studies there is a loss to public revenues following the introduction of TTIP at least in the short and medium term and I agree with that. Uh, finally, uh, all, all the studies uh, tend to um, uh, rule out the important presence of financial flows or of the financial sector in general. And I believe this is particularly unrealistic because we, we are clearly presented every day with uh, reasons to um, accept the reality that financial sectors and financial flows are very important in today's economic life. So the question is, when we have all these assumptions clear in our minds, does it still make sense to think that uh, this agreement that one, uh, would bring economic growth and, and uh, positive economic benefits? Well, the way to answer that would be to remove these assumptions and see what happens, to see if these assumptions are really determining driving the results. So I tried to do that using a model that does not suffer from these that I see as limitations. And this model is a model used by the United Nations. It's called Global Policy Model. It's been used by the United Nations now for seven or eight years with 
excellent results. Um, it is now managed by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, which is the United Nations body that specializes in the analysis of trade and, and international um, investment. Um, in, it's a model that's performed very well, in many cases better than other models, in assessing uh, important vulnerabilities uh, uh, in, in, of the world economy. Uh, and it has opposing features to those that I explained. It, it doesn't have this full employment assumption. This is very important. This, I, this idea of flexible prices that I, I mentioned a moment ago is uh, an also called full employment assumption because these, uh, the, the standard model assumes that employment is never an issue because it rules out the possibility that there is unemployment thanks to this idea that the flexibility of wages takes care of it immediately. Well, because I don't find it um, uh, realistic, I use this model that does not have the full employment assumption. At the same time, in this model, the structural features of, of the economy depend on both the uh, short-term features of the economy, basically what position the business cycle is in, and also the, the long-term trends. This is very important and it's something that is uh, typically uh, underestimated. Uh, now, I need to move on quickly because I don't have a lot of time. Uh, my simulation strategy was to not question the projections uh, that the, the uh, official assessments made of the expansion of trade. But I took those projections as granted and I thought, okay, if trade is supposed to expand in that way that we seen a moment ago, what's that going to mean for the economy as a whole, for incomes and employment? Um, and I assumed that uh, the economy adjusts in three different ways. So I drop the idea that it adjusts with flexible prices, but I assume that it, it adjusts um, by um, with basically um, reacting uh, to the a new increased competition with um, um, reductions of the um, cost of labor. So whenever the United States and the European Union are pushed to compete more against each other, what, what happens is that in order to compete and defend their market shares, they will tend to push down their labor costs to become more competitive. And um, the other mechanism that I assume is that um, because of the, f uh, the fall in demand, in, in the level of business that, that follows this um, uh, loss of labor income, uh, I, I um, assume that somehow the economy will respond by increasing lending, uh, which is something that we've seen happen in both in the United States and the European Union in the years that led up to the crisis. It's a potentially dangerous mechanism. So um, uh, let's see the results that, that I got out of this small exercise. Now, there are broadly positive effects on the US economy. And then there are negative effects pretty much on all accounts in, in most um, European countries. Um, the um, uh, Netherlands is here, other northern and, and western Europe, unfortunately doesn't uh, feature as a standalone country in the model. But you see that um, in, in all European areas we have negative impacts uh, in terms of net exports, in terms of income, in terms of employment, we have losses across the board in Europe. In terms of employment income, that is the, in per, the income per employee would um, uh, fall in all areas. We have losses in terms of net uh, taxes and we have uh, an increase in the dependency ratio, that is the number of people that are sustained by one job, both through formal social protection systems or through informal would increase. Now, um, the, the, way to, the easy way to explain this is to show that, so the labor share, that is the cut of total income that goes to labor, would decrease, and these are this, the, the dark lines, would decrease following the introduction of TTIP. And this is because the, the various economy would um, start a, a rush to the bottom, a race to the bottom, in order to defend their market shares. Now these um, shares have been falling already for many years. So, uh, uh, the purchasing power of laborers would keep decreasing following the introduction of TTIP because economies would have to defend their labor shares. Now, um, the European Union would, ha would have to do this in a particularly strong way because it would be facing the United States where the average labor cost, um, the, the unit labor cost, or the, or the labor share, that is the cut of total income that goes to labor, is 53%. Now, in every European country, we're much higher. That means Europe produces by using more labor uh, per unit of output. So 
it is less competitive than the United States. So TTIP would pin the U European Union economies against a, a, an economy that is more competitive than them. And of course, what we can expect, it seems reasonable to me to expect, that this would start a, a, some form of race or big effort to make our economies more competitive. But this means taking labor, um, taking income out of labor even more than it has already happened with some serious consequences. Now, we would also have an impact on financial instability because following the fall of demand because of the income that is taken away from, from, the labor, from laborers, um, the economy would be, if history is any guidance, would be um, um, uh, in the, um, um, incent incentivized to sustain demand increasing um, lending or increasing the valuation of capital stock. In other, in other words, we would create the conditions for another um, financial bubble. Now, summarizing the results. Uh, it seems to me that based on this uh, results that I'd, I'd be happy to clarify later in the debate, Europe would suffer, would have a net negative effect. The US would have a mixed effect because it would have positive impacts, but the quality of jobs studies show might, might suffer from it. The developing regions would have a mixed income. So the world as a whole would suffer from higher inequality, higher instability, and potential uh, financial bubbles. And so the policy implications that I draw out of this are uh, TTIP seems like a step in the wrong direction because it adds more challenges to employment, it, um, it subjects employment to more competition and more flexibility instead of doing the opposite, su su um, supporting labor incomes in order to uh, sustain demand. And so, if anything, we need a change of course for a sustainable uh, growth strategy for Europe. We need exactly the opposite. We need to sustain labor incomes with um, uh, strong formal social protection support and, um, and um, by keeping financial markets in check. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Capallo.